This was a video requested by a subscriber quite some time ago. Uh, so apologies for the delay. Uh, Autumn Yol Nashoba, if you're still watching, this is what you wanted. To set the context for the ships we're going to talk about, let's go back in time a bit further. In the Age of Sail and the Wooden Steam era, the role of cruiser didn't really exist as a ship class. There were ships suitable for long-range cruises, but these could be of many types. Brigs and sloops were small enough to operate almost indefinitely, hopping along between ports. Some frigates could make hugely long voyages from point to point, and many were used for exploration in times of peace. But even smaller ships of the line, such as third rates, weren't too bad at extended operations. But most commonly, the kind of ship used for long-duration patrols would have been something along the lines of a small sixth-rate frigate, or similar. As the 1860s rolled around, the capital warship, the ship of the line, was being replaced by the ironclad, in many different sizes, shapes, and layouts. But the ships below this, the ships that scouted for the fleet, protected and attacked trade, and did a lot of the show-the-flag missions, were still unarmoured, and quite often wooden. In part, this was because even when HMS Devastation heralded the end of the need for sails in a battle fleet, the ranges covered by cruising ships were still far beyond the capacity of existing engine technology, and so these ships were still largely, or at least partially, sail-powered, which meant keeping the hull relatively light in order to have the speed to be able to avoid or outlast the heavier ironclads. At first, attempts to build a light ironclad were tried, uh, but this led to such an increase in weight and decrease in speed that progressive attempts lengthened the ships further and further to the point they actually became longer than most battle line units and ended up semi-accidentally producing the armoured cruiser, which was both powerful and long-ranged but still far too slow to catch other smaller and lighter cruisers, as these ships were gradually becoming known. These armoured cruisers had belt armour, additional protection from their coal reserves whilst these lasted, an armoured deck to keep incoming shells away from the guns, completing a citadel box, and on many another lower armoured deck outside the citadel to try and keep the worst of enemy fire away from the below the waterline parts of the ship, which are the most important since letting air into the top of a ship is nowhere near as bad as letting in water to the bottom of a ship. Technology, however, continued to advance very rapidly, and a number of iron-hulled ships began to make an appearance without armoured belts, but with low-mounted armoured decks of varying degrees of coverage. The Italia-class battleships being one example, and a number of corvettes, including the British Comus and Calypso classes, being others. In these cases, extra coal storage was again used as impromptu armour, with the deck itself being somewhat curved in places on certain ship glasses. Largely, to be fair, in an attempt to get the belt as low as possible in the ship whilst still covering the rise of the ship's machinery, but introducing a degree of turtleback style protection at the same time, more intentionally in some designs than in others. But of course, Italia was supposed to be a battle unit, and the British corvettes were closer to colonial gunboats and peacekeepers than what we might envisage as a cruiser. One of the biggest issues was guns. Smaller guns, of course, meant less weight on a ship, and you could have more guns as a result. But their rate of fire was not that much greater than the larger guns and the larger guns gave ships more range and hitting power per shot. But if you used too many of these larger guns, people started talking about second-class battleships, and you ended up with a huge bill, along with a reluctance to send such powerful units far from home, which kind of defeated the object of a cruiser somewhat. Of course, the continuing development of guns, which was making them more and more powerful, wasn't helping matters either. On the flip side, engines were also gradually becoming more efficient. The breakthrough came with a combination of all of these factors, 
along with the emergence of the first quick-firing naval guns at lower calibres, and the start of this process of quick-firing modification beginning to take hold at these small to medium calibres, which increased their rate of fire as well, although not to full quick-firing levels until later in the century. The ship that came together as a result of all this was the Chilean vessel Esmeralda, built by Armstrong Whitworth on the River Tyne in their Ellswick shipyard. This particular ship would take all the elements that had percolated through other earlier designs and fuse them into a single unit. She would dispense with sails entirely, but still had a long enough range to operate on a cruiser mission. Her speed of just over 18 knots was more than enough to stay ahead of the battleships of her era. Her armament consisted of a couple of large 10-inch guns for shooting at small ironclads and large cruisers, a secondary battery of half a dozen 6-inch guns that let her lay into ships closer to her own size at a bit of a faster rate of fire, and a mixture of quick-firing 6- and 2-pounder guns that gave her a close-range and anti-torpedo boat broadside, which was becoming more and more important in the 1880s and 1890s. Finally, her armour would show a full turtle-back configuration, with coal piled onto what was otherwise a relatively thin but full-length armoured deck. There was no armour belt, and her hull was otherwise fully exposed to the effects of gunfire, but with the magazines and machinery below the deck itself. The only really exposed part that could cause serious damage to the ship if it was hit was the main and secondary gun emplacements, and these carried gun shields to protect them from splinters and blast. All this on a displacement of just under 3,000 tonnes. Not half bad, really, for the effort. The arrival of this ship would almost immediately lead to a flood of orders for Armstrong, for numerous cruisers to approximately this layout, leading to ships that had a single heavy gun forward and another aft, with a secondary battery of broadside lighter guns, and a sloped armoured deck low in the ship, becoming commonplace very quickly amongst major and minor navies all across the world as they rushed to adopt them. The Armstrong Company would also license out designs when the Ellswick yards were at full capacity, and of course the inevitable copies of the layout in other yards around the world would come along sooner or later. This would see the protected cruiser come into being almost simultaneously across the planet. It may come as little surprise to naval historians that the man largely responsible for all of this was Sir William Henry White, who had spent most of his life as a Royal Navy naval architect, and was taking a short break in the private sector at the time, before rejoining the Royal Navy in 1885 to invent the Royal Sovereign class of battleships, which compete with the later Majestic class for the title of first true pre-dreadnoughts. Given that effectively inventing the modern cruiser and inventing the pre-dreadnought is only part of his resume, which included a direct hand in designing over 240 individual warships, it is perhaps to be expected that the Ellswick Yards, under his guidance, would produce the Ellswick cruisers, and that these would really take off in naval circles. Whilst Esmeralda herself would eventually be sold to the Japanese Navy in the mid-1890s as Japan sought to boost its fleet during its war with China, the Ellswick Yards would continue to set the standard for protected cruiser design. Almost immediately afterwards, commencing on building the larger and more powerful Naniwa class, as well as Yoshino and Tagasago for Japan, uh, the Ventisinco de Mayo, Nueva de Julio, and Buenos Aires for Argentina, the four Chakabuku class for Brazil, which in something of a foreshadowing of the South American Dreadnought race, ended up all over the place except for Brazil, with the first one being sold to Chile before completion as Ministro Zenteno, the second unbelievably actually made it to Brazil as Almirante Barroso, and the third and fourth ended up in the United States Navy as the USS New Orleans and the USS Albany, as they happened to be sitting idle for sale, right as tensions that would eventually lead to the Spanish-American War were ramping up, and the Spanish were looking at them with interest. Hence, the USA 
dropped in and snagged them up very quickly. So for you World of Warships players out there who happen to have it, you can blame the Brazilians for the Albany. The Chileans would also later order the Chacabuco, O at the end, not a U, very important distinction, and Blanco Encalada, with the Italians picking up the Giovanni Bauson and Piemonte directly, and the Dugali after the Greek navy had been forced to abandon yet another ship called Salamis. China would collect the Qi Yuan, Qi Ching Yuan, Hai Tien, and Hai Qi. The Romanians ordered Elisabetta, Spain would buy Isla de Luzon and Isla de Cuba, and the Ottomans bought Hamidie. Weirdly, the British would not buy any single class from Armstrong, although the Ellswick Yards would produce a number of protected cruisers for the Royal Navy as part of larger classes whose orders had been distributed to a number of different British yards, including Ellswick. As you might be able to tell from that list, it was a bit of a busy old time for the Ellswick Yards, along with other business being found building multiple armoured cruisers and battleships for both foreign and domestic use at the same time. During this period, the designs would vary wildly according to the customer, with some ships being much larger vessels carrying improved 10-inch main guns, whilst others being much smaller and only using the smaller guns with no larger weapons, and everything in between. And of course, as time went on, the introduction of 4.7-inch and 6-inch quick-firing guns changed things up again. By the time the Ellswick Yard built its last protected cruisers, the tertiary armament for use against torpedo boats was substantially larger, and torpedo tubes themselves were beginning to make an appearance on Ellswick cruiser designs. For all the excitement and that impressive build list, as a design, these ships didn't actually last that long. The protected cruiser was built for a shorter period even than the armoured cruiser. The last few being built in the early 1900s as advances in armour, guns and engines began to leave the protected cruiser behind and a new breed of oil fueled turbine driven cruisers with light armour belts exploiting the advances in armour technology as well as protected decks began to appear. With quick firing guns giving significant advantages and battleships ascending to levels where 8 and 10 inch guns didn't really pose any real threat, these ships would exhibit a uniform main battery of medium calibre guns, usually somewhere around the 6 inch mark. These so called light armoured cruisers, or scout cruisers, would then be developed through World War I, eventually seeing their final form in the Hawkins, Emerald, Omaha, and Sendai classes immediately after World War I. These would in turn give way to ships with their guns in double or triple turrets instead of the mainly single guns of the earlier ships, and these would in turn become the treaty cruisers of the interwar period, and eventually the light and heavy cruisers of World War II. So, all things considered, the Ellswick cruisers could be said to have been the starting point of practically all modern gun cruisers in the age of steam and steel. Not a bad legacy for what started out as a small 3,000 ton export cruiser that just happened to solve almost all the problems that had been vexing every major navy on the planet up until that point. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.